Hello, everybody. It's just about time to get started now. Um, welcome to the webinar today. Um, today we're uh, very happy to be hosting a joint webinar uh, with ACD Bio, uh, Advanced um, Cell Diagnostics. So today we're going to have two speakers on. Um, one is Courtney Anderson from uh, Advanced Cell Diagnostics and Sean Griffiths who is an application scientist from Indica Lab. So I'm going to give him a formal introduction to both of them uh, in one second. But first, I just wanted to say, everyone who's coming in is muted um, upon entry. So if you have questions for either of these presenters, please put those questions into the chat or the Q&A panel, and please direct them to the host. Those will come to me, and I will give the questions to Courtney uh, and or Sean at the end of the presentations today. So first up today, we have Courtney Anderson, uh, who is a senior scientist in research and development at Advanced Cell Diagnostics. Courtney is a senior scientist uh, in Newark, California. In her current role, Courtney manages numerous projects with collaborators from around the globe to demonstrate new and exciting applications of the RNA scope technology and its ability to detect RNA biomarkers with single molecule sensitivity and single cell resolution with morphological context. Prior to joining ACD, Courtney completed her postdoctoral studies in metabolic um, biology at the University of California in Berkeley. So today, Courtney is going to introduce RNA Scope um, to all of us um, and give a little bit of background on the technology behind it. And then Sean Griffiths from Indica Labs is going to talk about the specific um, quantitative um, analysis that's available to uh, analyze the RNA Scope um, assays. So Sean is an application scientist um, in Europe. He has a background in cellular, endocrine, and molecular biology, coupled with experience in high-content cell screening and protein binding characterization using force uh, spectroscopy. During his doctoral studies, Sean characterized expression patterns of key embryo, embryo tethering proteins using an endometrial cell line model and automated cell population image analysis on tissue. Following his studies, Sean worked for Malvern Instruments to support their innovation products range, uh, biophysical protein characterization, and is currently employed as an application scientist at Indica Labs. So welcome both of our presenters today. Um, and Courtney, I'll go ahead and uh, give control over to you if you want to turn on your microphone. Hey, great. Thank you very much, Kate. And thank you all for joining us today. I would like to present to you uh, the current state-of-the-art tissue-based RNA analysis platform, RNAScope. RNAScope is an RNA in situ hybridization technology developed uh, here in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area by Advanced Cell Diagnostics, or ACD. Okay. In this webinar, I will delve into the specifics of the RNAScope technology platform, including our unique probe design, signal amplification system, and signal detection methods. I will demonstrate the benefits of RNAScope over other conventional gene expression analysis methods, as well as describe a few applications of the RNA scope technology. I'll briefly touch upon the products and services we offer, and lastly, give an overview of the ways in which one can analyze RNA scope data, followed by the utilization of the HALO software system to analyze RNA scope images. So, first, I'd like to discuss the RNA scope technology. The technology behind the RNA scope ISH assay has three main advantages over conventional gene expression analysis methods. One is that it generates very high signal amplification with suppression of background compared to traditional RNA-ish. Two, it can detect single RNA molecules in single cells with morphological context, unlike grind and bind methods such as PCR. And three, it is universal. The assay can detect virtually any gene in any tissue from any species, provided the sequence is known. Unlike IHC, where getting an antibody to perform with specificity and high sensitivity is a very challenging prospect. And if an antibody is not available, it can be time consuming and costly to develop one. So here is a brief overview of the RNA scope method. It is a slide based method intended for use on the same types of samples you would use for either IHC or immunofluorescence. This includes either FFPE or what's known as formal and fixed paraffin embedded or fresh or fixed frozen tissue sections or cells. The RNA scope methodology involves hybridizing the target-specific oligonucleotide probes to the target RNA. 
The target probe is a pool of algos that we've designed using established informatic tools to provide an assay which we guarantee will be single target specific. Detection is enabled through an amplification procedure that involves sequential hybridization steps to build up a tree-like structure shown here schematically, which I will describe in more detail on the following slides. Through this method, we are able to localize a tremendous amount of signal to an individual transcript to the point where we can actually detect and visualize individual transcripts as dots in a field of cells. This visualization of punctate dots allows for quantification of gene expression detected by the RNA scope assay. The first key feature of the RNA scope technology is the probe design. We depict the oligonucleotide target specific probes as Zs to emphasize the fact that they have two regions linked by a spacer. Each one of these oligonucleotide sequences has been designed using an informatics algorithm that selects sequences to specifically bind physically to the target sequence and not cross-hybridize with any other sequences. The bottom of the Z complements and hybridizes to the target transcript. For amplification to occur, two Zs must hybridize to the target sequence right next to each other. Once this happens, this creates a 50 base pair target-specific binding site on the bottom of the ZZ pair. The top of the ZZ is the top of the Z, excuse me, is the base for the amplification structure. When two Zs hybridize, it creates a binding site upon which a pre-amplifier can bind and the amplification tree can be built. A standard RNA scope probe for a target sequence of 1,000 bases or more will consist of 20 ZZ pairs pulled together that are designed to hybridize next to each other along a target region. This allows for a tremendous amount of amplification and signal potential. However, only a few ZZ pairs are needed to bind the to the target RNA sequence in order to generate enough signal for molecular detection. The next feature of the RNA scope technology I'd like to discuss is the signal amplification. After hybridization of the ZZ pair with the target RNA, each ZZ pair creates a 28 nucleotide binding site at the upper portion of the Z for the signal preamplifier to bind. Each preamplifier can bind multiple amplifiers, and each amplifier can further bind multiple labeled probes, sequentially hybridizing to assemble a branching complex at each ZZ binding site. Labeled probes can contain a chromogenic enzyme such as horseradish peroxidase or HRP that generates a visible signal after chromogenic reaction, such as with DAB. This is detectable under a standard bright field microscope. The labeled probes can also contain fluorophores that allow for direct visualization of the signal under a fluorescent microscope. This signal amplification strategy allows for visualization of target RNAs as a single dot, where each dot represents an individual RNA molecule. So provided that the target is expressed in the sample and the protocol is followed as recommended, the RNA scope assay is guaranteed. Because tissue samples can be highly variable, proper sample preparation and the right controls are essential to an RNA, experiment, RNA scope experiment. Tissue samples must be properly fixed and prepared so that there is good quality RNA in the sample and no background due to poor fixation. ACD provides guidelines on how tissues should be fixed for optimal performance of the RNA scope assay. What I show here are serial sections from a human lung cancer sample on which we performed the manual red chromogenic assay. On the left is a section stained with our negative control probe, DAP-B. Um, DAP-B is a bacterial gene that is not expressed in intact tissue. As we observe in this sample, there should be no signal from DAP-B. In the middle panel, is a section from the same sample stained with our positive control probe for the housekeeping gene PBIB. As observed with this sample, you want to see fairly uniform detection with the positive control probe, indicating good quality RNA. Certain tissues may express the positive control at higher or lower levels, but in general, you want to see expression throughout the sample. With the results from these two probes, we can have confidence in the test data we see in the right pan panel. As an example, I am showing a section from the same lung cancer sample probed for the immune checkpoint marker program death ligand 1 or PDL1. PDL1 exhibits a wide range of expression in tumor tissues. In this human lung cancer sample, we observe strong punctate dots with the PDL1 probe, indicating expression of PDL1 in this tumor sample. 
The controls show us that there is good quality RNA throughout the tissue sample and that there's little to no background. So we can be confident that the localized pattern of expression we observed for PDL1 is in fact the correct result. So now I'd like to highlight some of the key benefits of the RNA scope technology. First, the assay is highly sensitive. Our RNA in situ platform can detect individual RNA molecules that can be visualized as dots. And this high sensitivity stems from our probe design and amplification system. The multiple pooled ZZ pairs in a probe, along with multiple ampli pre-amplifiers, amplifiers, and labeled probes, leads to an amplification tree that makes it possible to visualize a single RNA transcript as a dot. In addition, we have confirmed that indeed each dot in an RNA scope assay represents a single mRNA transcript. Here is data from the labs at ACD comparing the number of HER2 dots detected in situ by the RNA scope assay to the HER2 copy number detected in solution by the Quantigene assay. <clears throat> On the left are HeLa cells probed for HER2 in green and 18S in red by the RNA scope multiplex fluorescent assay. On the right is the quantification of HER2 mRNA copy number in HeLa cells as determined by the quantitative solution based assay Quantigene. The dot number determined by the RNA scope assay, which was 14.4 dots per cell, correlated well with the copy number per cell determined by Quantigene, which was 17 copies per cell. Taken together, these results are consistent with each RNA dot in an RNA scope assay deriving from a single RNA molecule. It is important to note that while every dot represents an individual RNA molecule, not every RNA molecule may be detected as a dot due to sample preparation and quality. To demonstrate the sensitivity of the RNA scope assay compared to traditional ISH, I am showing here a direct comparison of the chromogenic RNA scope assay with traditional non-isotopic RNA ISH. And these images come from Jake Estes at the NCI. This is monkey lymphoid tissue stained for simian immunodeficiency virus, or SIV, and detected with the red chromogen. As you can see here, SIV detection is far greater with the chromogenic RNA scope assay, shown in the left image, compared to traditional non-isotopic RNA-ish using a probe that targets the same SIV sequence as shown in the right image. Overall, the RNA scope assay is 100 times more sensitive than conventional non-isotopic RNA-ish. The second benefit of the RNA scope assay is that it is highly specific due to the suppressed background generated by our unique probe design. One of the fundamental challenges of traditional RNA-ish is that it can generate low signal and high background, compromising the interpretation and results of the assay. With the RNA scope assay, background is eliminated because the signal is dependent on two Zs binding to the target sequence. If both Zs do not bind, then the pre-amplifier cannot form a stable hybridization to the target sequence, and the amplification tree does not get built. Consequently, no amplification of nonspecific hybridization occurs, generating little to no background signal. To demonstrate the specificity of the RNA scope assay compared to isotopic RNA-ish, I am showing a direct comparison of the chromogenic RNA scope assay with traditional isotopic RNA-ish. Human liver tissue was probed with IGF BP3 using either RNA scope in the left image or isotopic RNA ish in the right image. The black arrows indicate specific IGF BP3 staining, while the white arrows indicate nonspecific background. The chromogenic RNA scope assay resulted in far more specific signal of IGF BP3 with little to no nonspecific background compared to isotopic RNA ish, which has quite a bit of nonspecific signal. In addition, the RNA scope assay signal was detected within 10 minutes, while the isotopic assay required two days of radiograph exposure. Lastly, another benefit of the RNA scope assay over isotopic ish is the elimination of cumbersome radioactively labeled probes. Overall, the RNA scope assay generates more signal with less background and in faster time than isotopic RNA ish. The third benefit of the RNA scope technology is its single cell resolution coupled with the ability to quantify. Single cell resolution mapping and quantitation of target transcripts with morphological context 
is possible with the RNA scope assay. Unlike grind and bind methods, such as PCR or NGS, which do not provide morphological context and average the gene expression across cell populations. To demonstrate the benefits of single cell resolution with morphological context, we examined a non-small cell lung carcinoma sample for co-expression of the immune checkpoint markers PDL1 and PDL2 using the manual chromogenic duplex RNA scope assay. As shown here on the left, we see that PDL1 in green is expressed primarily in the tumor region, whereas PDL2, shown here in red, is mainly expressed in the stromal region with little to no expression in the tumor. A grind and bind method such as PCR would not be able to detect this type of cellular resolution from this section. So overall, the RNA scope assay is capable of single molecule detection with single cell resolution and morphological context. The fourth benefit of RNA scope is its universality. The RNA scope assay can be performed for virtually any gene in any species in any tissue, provided the sequence is known. To demonstrate the ability of RNA scope to detect gene expression in multiple tissues from multiple species, we examined expression of the macrophage marker CD68 and the endothelial cell marker PCAM1 in multiple tissues from rat, monkey, and dog. As seen here in the top panel, RNA scope can detect CD68 expression in rat liver, monkey colon, and dog lymph node. In the bottom panel, we show detection of PCAN1 by RNA scope in rat heart, monkey kidney, and dog liver. Taken together, these data demonstrate the universality of the RNA scope assay. And lastly, the RNA scope assay is rapid. Currently, we have over 8,000 catalog probes readily available, and new probes can easily be generated in two weeks. And the standard assay takes just eight hours from start to finish. Despite both assays offering expression analysis with morphological context, the RNA scope assay has many advantages compared to IHC. First, while IHC can only detect coding genes, RNA scope can detect both coding and non coding genes, such as long non coding RNAs or link RNAs, for which antibody detection is just not possible. For example, in the left panel, the RNA scope assay was used to detect expression of the link RNA PCA3 in prostate cancer. Second, RNA scope probes are highly sensitive and specific, while many antibodies have limited sensitivity and specificity, if they even exist. Development of new antibodies is time consuming and costly, whereas RNA scope probes can be generated rapidly within two weeks. Third, IHC is only semi-quantitative, while the RNA scope assay is fully quantifiable. And lastly, RNA can provide different biological information than protein, such as insight on protein or RNA stability, mRNA trafficking, and secreted proteins. Therefore, the RNA scope assay can be an ideal complement to an IHC assay, as well as be a great solution when no antibody exists or for validating antibodies. Now I would like to just touch upon a few applications of the RNA scope assay. Many tumors display what is known as intratumor heterogeneity, in which a single tumor may contain cells with different morphological and or phenotypic profiles. Accurate identification of intratumor gene expression heterogeneity can aid in properly stratifying patients for drug therapy. In the example shown here, which is a non-small cell lung carcinoma sample probed for the immune checkpoint markers PDL1 and CTLA4 using the RNA scope assay, we can see one population of tumor cells that has very high expression of PDL1, shown here in green with the dashed arrow, and in the same tumor section, another population of cells with low PDL1 expression, shown here with the solid arrow. And then there's a third population of tumor cells with no PDL1 expression, denoted by the asterisk. We can also see that PDL1 is expressed mainly in the tumor cells, while CTLA4 is mainly expressed in stromal cells. This data demonstrates the utility of the RNA scope assay in detecting heterogeneous gene expression within a tumor compared to other molecular profiling assays that lack this single cell resolution and morphological context. With regard to infectious disease, the vast majority of HIV and SIV-infected individuals 
experienced persistent high-level viral replication that, in the absence of combination antiretroviral therapy, leads to AIDS. However, rare individuals, known as elite controllers, or ECs, are able to mount a highly effective immune response that can suppress viral replication to very low levels. Yet even this highly effective immune response of the elite controllers can fail to completely clear HIV or SIV infection. In this study, Fukuzawa and colleagues assessed whether B cell follicular immune privilege provides a barrier to CD8 positive T cells, in turn allowing SIV infection to persist in elite controllers. Using the RNA scope assay on lymph node sections from either elite controllers or total progressor rhesus monkeys with a probe for SIV, the authors were able to confirm the anatomic distribution of SIV positive cells. Productive SIV infection in elite controllers was markedly restricted to the B cell follicle, whereas in total progressor, progressors, SIV RNA positive lymphoid cells were observed within both the B cell follicle and in the T cell zone. Identification of this B cell follicle sanctuary is an important finding because this shielding may constitute a barrier to CD8 positive T cell mediated eradication or functional cure of HIV infection. In the neuro field, despite several studies on the topic, there is much debate about the spinal cord circuits through which itch producing stimuli trigger the scratching response. It has been proposed that gastrin-releasing peptide, or GRP, expressing neurons provide the input to gastrin-releasing peptide receptor, or GRPR neurons, in the dorsal root ganglia, or DRG, while other studies conclude that the dorsal horn is the source of GRP. Solorzano and colleagues sought to resolve this issue by investigating the expression pattern of GRP and its receptor GRPR in mouse spinal cord. The authors performed the RNA scope multiplexfluorescent assay on spinal cord sections with detection of GRP and its receptor GRPR. In this image shown here, we can see that while GRP positive cells, shown here in green, and GRPR positive cells, shown here in red, are in close association with one another, the signals actually do not co localize, indicating that there is no overlap of these interneuron populations. Combined with additional data, the authors show overall that GRP is indeed expressed in the interneurons of the superficial dorsal horn of the mouse spinal cord and not in DRG neurons. Lastly, I'd like to show the use of the RNA scope assay in patient-derived xenograft or PDX tumor models. PDX models contain human cancerous tissue growing in a mouse stromal environment and are widely used for cancer research and drug discovery. Multiple Gene profiling methods, such as microarray and RNA-seq, have been applied to investigate human and murine gene expression in PDX tumor models. And while these assays may be able to identify the species of origin for the PDX transcriptome, it is difficult to reconstruct the spatial distribution and heterogeneity of the transcripts of interest. We use specially designed species-specific probes based on the RNA scope technology to visualize gene expression in the human tumor and mouse stroma of two types of PDX mouse models, liver cancer and colorectal cancer. On the left are sections from the liver cancer PDX model probed for either human TGF-beta-1 in the top panel or mouse TGF-beta-1 in the bottom panel. What we observed was specific detection of human TGF-beta-1 in the tumor cells with no detection of TGF-beta-1 in the mouse stroma. Conversely, we observed specific detection of mouse TGF-beta-1 probe in the mouse stroma and no detection in human tumor cells. Shown here on the right is our automated duplex assay performed on the Leica system with human and mouse probes for the target gene EGFR. This experiment showed specific detection of human EGFR, depicted here in brown, in tumor cells and mouse EGFR in red in the stroma in the same section. This further demonstrates the capability of the RNA scope platform in distinguishing gene expression in a species specific manner with morphological context. And now I'd like to just briefly review some of our products and services. We offer the manual assay with both chromogenic detection, including singleplex brown and red and duplex 
brown red and duplex green red, as well as multiplex fluorescent detection with up to three colors. We also offer fully automated assays that are compatible with both the Leica Biosystems Bond RX and Ventana Discovery instrumentation. If you would prefer to have us run these assays for you, we can perform the experiments at ACD using the same products and the same analysis tools I've described today through our Pharma Assay Services Group. It can take as little as four weeks from when we receive your samples to delivering results to you. As the last part of my talk, I would like to just touch upon some RNA scope data analysis methods and then turn the talk over to Sean from Indica Labs for further detail. RNA scope data can be analyzed by both semi quantitative and quantitative methods. With the semi quantitative method, a score is assigned to a sample based on the average number of dots per cell. Shown here on the right is the semi quantitative scoring system that ACD has generated for the RNA scope assay, and shown below are representative images for each score. A score of zero has no staining or less than one dot for every 10 cells whereas a score of four has greater than 15 dots per cell. The challenge with this analysis method is that it is performed manually and is only semi-quantitative. Another way to analyze RNA scope data that is more objective and rapid is using an automated software analysis platform such as HALO. I will now turn the talk over to Sean from Indica Labs who will provide more detail on the HALO software and its application for analyzing RNA scope data. Thank you so much, Courtney. Um, Sean, I've made you the presenter if you want to share your desktop. That was a great introduction to the RNA scope technology. So now Sean Griffiths from Indica Labs is going to give us an introduction to the HALO platform um, and show us how HALO can be used to analyze um, some of these various assays. Thank you, Sean. Okay, thanks for that. And um, welcome to the second part of the webinar today. Where, as Kate mentions, we'll look at the analysis of these RNA scope generated images using HALO. Okay, so for the first part of this uh, second segment, we'll look at what HALO is. For those of you who are not familiar with the software platform, we'll look at some of the modules that are available. Then we'll dive on in and look at some of the specific modules that are designed to work with both bright field and fluorescent ish images. And finally, we'll uh, go ahead and demonstrate some of this analysis on the software in real time so you can get an idea of um, how this actually works. Okay, so to introduce Halo, there are four the, um, key themes that run throughout the software. The first of which is that the system is easy to use image analysis uh, solutions can be very difficult and complicated. And as this system has been developed and evolved over the last few years, we've tried to retain the ease of use so that anyone can pick up the software and start using the basic analysis quite quickly. Secondly, we think that fast selection of regions of interest is something very useful and will help keep the workflow um, quite rapid as you progress through image analysis. We can do this in a manual way using a variety of input tools. And you can see the, the input device there in the image. You can do it in a semi-automated fashion or indeed in a, in a very automated way. Next, we have extensive analytics. And a good example of some of the analytics we've introduced recently is spatial analysis. And this is part of HALO 2. And it allows you to compare uh, the proximity of different cell types, either from multiple uh, labeling of the same image, or indeed from serial section analysis of registered images. And finally, the thing that I think best defines HALO is the modular and scalable aspect of the software. So HALO can be um, consisting of a single module up until uh, an installation of 20 modules. And the benefit of this for the end user is really the fact that you don't acquire or indeed purchase any additional functionality that isn't necessary for your particular application space. Okay, so let's have a look at this easy to use interface. We can see here 
in the animation that a user is trying to quantify a nuclear stain in the image. You can see this in brown here. They taught Halo what to look for by selecting the stain from the image. And now they're going to open a real-time tuning window that visually reflects what Halo is detecting from the image. You can see the markup image there where blue cells are shown to be negative for stain and then a, a series of yellow, orange, and red labeled nuclei showing uh, intense staining. The user is able to set these thresholds and watch as the markup image changes in real time. And this really helps you to quickly set up scoring for new biomarkers using a variety of stains because you choose the stain from the image. You can then save these settings and run the analysis in batch mode across a large number of samples. So what you can see there in the background is we're using Halo's annotation tool to quickly grab a large region of tissue. Okay, so now moving on to this selection of regions of interest. We just saw the user grab and use the uh, annotation tool to snap around region of tissue. When you've created this annotation, you can then amend it by redrawing, moving, rotating, or copying and pasting existing annotations. Even better, we can teach the tissue classifier to automatically select tissues of interest for analysis across multiple images. So if I draw your attention to the three panes in the top half of the screen, the, the first pane on the left-hand side shows tumor tissue intermingled with the stromal region. By painting the image using Halo and making a few sampling marks, we're able to classify tissue into two subgroups containing tumor and stroma. If we move across to the final pane, we can see that the analysis the user was performing earlier, where they were looking at nuclear expression of this biomarker, is now confined to one particular class. Some of the examples Courtney showed earlier, where expression is localized to a tumor or stroma, highlight how this type of tissue classification on an automated scale can be immensely beneficial to analysis. Okay, so I talked about the extensive analytics, and here's a good example of the interactive imagery that we get with such a software platform. Following completion of analysis, we have um, an image in the main viewer, but also a data table shown in the bottom left-hand uh, corner of the laptop screen. By clicking on one of the cells in the image, we bring that cell's information up in the data table, allowing you to very quickly QC whether the information about biomarker expression, for example, is reflected in the numerical output of the data table. This also works the other way around, and it's possible to select, um, sort, and filter the data in the table to allow you to mine through the cell population. So for example, pick out cells that are only positive for your biomarker of interest. And finally, I should address the modular nature of HALO. HALO allows you to start with a small number of modules. Um, this would typically be a HALO plus one installation. So you'd have two free modules and one module of your choosing, for example, the in-situ hybridization module. And then you can add more modules as your needs change or as your area of research changes direction. You can use HALO on a single workstation license and this would be applicable if you had, for example, a single power user um, who conducted a large amount of image analysis. Alternatively, you can install Halo on up to 10 PCs in a group license. You can also rent software on an annual basis, which again is another neat way of driving down the cost of the installation. Okay, so let's cover some general applications. Um, we use the term module and algorithms. Each algorithm typically covers an application space. This may be general or it may be quite specific. So the area quantification and area quantification FL algorithms, these are included as freebies 
in the installation of HALO. Now these act to first identify the presence and then quantify the intensity of stain across an area of tissue. Moving up the complexity ladder somewhat, we have the cytonuclear and cytonuclear fluorescent modules. And these record the same information from the image, however they associate it with a cell compartment, whether this be a nuclear or cytoplasmic expression. We also have this functionality in membrane assessment as well. Okay, moving on to something a bit more specific, we have the oncology applications. So immuno-oncology is quite a hot topic right now. And we have modules that are set up for this kind of approach. The immune cell, by identifying immune cells in a tissue, and associate them with um, objects in, in the image and look at the proximity of these cells surrounding the object. We've got DNA ish in fish. We also have the TMA or tissue microarray functionality, which is used to view a whole slide TMA, but then segment the individual cores for analysis. You can QC the cores on the basis of their uh, tissue presence, and you can also view the whole TMA in the form of a heat map to compare biomarker expression on a core by core basis. Okay, so finally, I'm going to move over this quite quickly. We have uh, specific applications here for metabolism, neuroscience research, and muscle fiber analysis, and so on. But we're going to move on and get into the meat of this section, which is the single and dual probe RNA scope analysis. So HALO allows you to analyze up to two chromogenic probes simultaneously in bright field. So this is something that's uh, really unique to HALO, the ability to do two chromogens. We also support area and cell-based analysis. So this means we can measure the number of probes per micron squared of tissue, or we can do a cell-based analysis where we count the number of probes associated with each cell. These outputs include the number of probe signals per cell, probe intensity, the area of the probe positivity, and the ratio of probe signals when two probes are selected. So this is useful when we're comparing a control probe or housekeeper against the experimental probe in some of the examples that Courtney showed earlier. We can look at co-expression data for multiple probes, and we now bin the cells according to probe number. So this designation, which we saw in the, some of the slides earlier, ranges from zero from plus one through to plus four. In the images here, we can see we've got the, the raw input image, showing the RNA scope assay. And then we have the halo markup image, which shows nuclei that have been identified. These are shaded in various colors. If the nuclei contain the experimental probe, it will be shaded in a varying degree of red. The darker the color, the more probes associated with that particular cell. The control cells are shown in green, and we have a third subset of cells which show co-localized probes, and these are shown in yellow. Okay, so moving on to the fluorescent side of things, HALO allows you to analyze up to four probes simultaneously from a fluorescent image. Again, we support the area and cell-based analysis. This time, the outputs are probe intensity, area of positivity, and we have a parameter that we calculate called integrated intensity. And this is determined by the probe intensity as an average across that cell and the area of probe positivity across that cell. We can calculate co-expression data from multiple probes. And a recent addition to this module was cell binning according to probe integrated intensity. So we, we have a cell scoring nomenclature based on the results that we generate. Okay, so that brings me to the end of the slide deck. So I'm going to minimize my PowerPoint and move over to Halo, see if we can show you some of this in, in real time. Okay, so when you open up Halo, this is the interface um, that you'll be presented with. If I draw your attention to the top left-hand corner, we have a series of 
the tabs and this ribbon. And these represent the workflow that one would proceed through in order to conduct image analysis. You would first open your images, load them into Halo, and finally analyze, then examine and export your results. Okay, so I'll start from the left and work across. We have the Studies tab here, where we've loaded some images into the software. The images may be localized on your computer, but they can also be stored remotely or integrated within an online slide management system. Okay, so moving across, we have the TMA module. Um, and I talked about this a little bit earlier. Next, we have the Annotations tab. And this really gives you access to the tools and here's the flood fill annotator tool that allow you to grab and quickly select regions based on uh, staining and or morphology of the tissue. We then have that classifier tab where you can paint regions of the image for an automated segmentation of tissue subtypes. And then we move on to the analysis. So for analysis today, I've got three images. The first is a, a kidney section which is a, has a single probe shown on it, and we'll kick off with this image. Okay, so to do some analysis, we would select Setting Actions, Load Settings, and this brings a, a dialog box showing the available algorithms with my particular configuration of Halo. Here you see the two free modules, Area Quantification and Area Quantification FL, and a range of more specialized modules. I'm going to load the in-situ hybridization 2.0 module. And now we have these parameter groupings. That when I click to open them, reveal a subset of parameters. OK, so we'll head on over to stain selection. And here you can see we've got some default colors that the algorithm will look for in order to identify nuclei and the nucleus stain, and identify the probe. So these don't really match up with the image at the moment. So we're going to ask Halo to choose the stain from the image itself. OK, so here's my dialog box that's opened. Now I simply find the nuclei on the image that I think represents the nuclear stain. By clicking on the image, I transpose those pixels into the sampling window. And then I simply increase the pixel zoom in order so that the sampling window is entirely filled with nuclear pixels only. This then generates an average of RBG optical density values. So if I select OK, this will then update so the algorithm will look for those nuclei. I'm going to repeat this process with probe stain 1. And I'll click on the region of the image that contains this brown staining. Again, I might have to zoom in a bit further because of the relative sizes of the nuclei and the RNA probe. But the same process is repeated. I'll then move up to the Analyze drop-down, and we'll see this real-time tuning window that I talked about earlier. OK, so I've opened the real-time tuning window, and we now see a markup image that appears and overlays our input image. This time, we have nuclei shown uh, nuclear um, coloration is determined by the number of probes per cell. So we have white objects, these are negative for probes. And then we have uh, graduated shades of red, or pink and red, showing numbers of probes increasing as the red gets darker. OK, so I'm going to move now to cell detection, do a bit of optimization so that I'm detecting some nuclei that I may be missing. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is to change cell radius from nuclei. So this is the, the black line that demarcates the cell boundary. I'm going to change this from 5 to 0. And the effect of this is it removes the, the black um, cell boundary. It allows us to see quite clearly whether we're missing any nuclei. I'd like to move around the image at this point just to ensure um, that our algorithm settings hold true for different regions. Okay, so some of these small nuclei are either being missed because they're, they're too small or possibly too faint, so their staining is, is not very intense. 
So to correct this, I'm going to change nuclear size and just reduce the minimum. And you should see that these small nuclei start to appear now in the market image. In a similar way, I can change the minimum nuclear optical density setting just to include some of these ones that are not shown on the first pass. Okay, so now I've optimized the cell detection, I'm going to go ahead and look at the probe detection. So to do this, we'll select detect cells and turn this to false. And this now allows us to focus on these brown spots on the image and have a look at the detection of these. Okay, so I'll move to probe one. And you can see that we've now got red and orange objects in the markup image. Orange objects reflect a single probe whereas the red clusters show multiple copies of the probe. And this is estimated on a size or area basis. I have settings where I can adjust the detection of the RNA probes. So you change this depending on your image. Well, I'm quite happy with that. So I'm going to go back to cell detection, turn detect cell to true. So we'll do a cell-based assessment. I'm going to change the cell radius from nuclei back to a positive value. And I'm going to select store object data, and set this to true. This will mean that we'll select and we'll gain information on a cell by cell basis rather than just an average across the cell population. Okay, so we're going to skip over, um, we've done probe one. Probe two, that's not present on this image, so we'll jump to cell classification. And here you can see the score and template that uh, Courtney mentioned in her slides earlier. And you can set this and you can change and edit depending if you uh, have a large number of probe copies. The advanced tab allows you to apply that classifier um, where we could possibly look at just cells within the tumor region or just cells within the stromal region. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and select Analyze. And we'll just analyze a field of view here. So I use the analyze drop down, hit field of view. We'll then see halo conductance analysis. Everything in this field of view has been, um, every nuclei has been analyzed. And the markup image now encompasses the whole field of view. Okay, so let's jump ahead to results. And we can see now we've got three different sections here, um, outputting results. The first is the summary data set. This shows the total cells included in this analysis. It was shown to be around 1,200. We then have the total number of probe one copies, just shy of 2,000. And then we have various other parameters recorded. But we have this scoring template here from zero to plus four. And you have a percentage of cells out of the total population that are categorized across this um, range. Probe 2 is not present in this image, so it's left as zero. Moving down, HALO will automatically generate histograms based on these numbers of cells. This allows you to compare quickly between experiments. Okay, so progressing further, we have the object data table, and this allows you to look at cells on a cell by cell basis. So if I turn off the markup image and click on a cell in the population, we can see information about that cell in the data table. This particular cell has zero copies of probe one. If I select another cell, we can see that it appears to have brown spots in its proximity and the table is showing this as well. Here's the little button that allows you to filter and sort and these cells based on their or any of their parameters. So if we select custom, uh, a good one here is does not equal and then you can enter zero. This is nice because it will allow you to select only the cells that have uh, at least one probe um, for your data export. Okay, so that was a rather simple example. I'm now going to progress to the next image. And we can see here we have a RNA scope image. Looks a little bit different to the previous example. Um, we're at higher magnification. Nuclei are more clustered. It could possibly be more difficult to segment. 
And the most obvious difference is we have two different probes. So we have the brown red example we saw in the slides earlier. Okay, so this time I'm going to select load settings, but I'm going to use the save settings tab and just import one of my previously optimized protocols. Again, I'm going to go to stain selection, and I've already chosen nuclear stain and probe one stain. In this example, we have a second probe, a control probe. So I'm going to just perform my stain selection on this control probe here. Okay, so we're now going to go ahead and turn on the real-time tuning window again. And we can see a markup image that's generated showing the red cells, which are reflective of the cells that are showing the, the red probe, so the experimental probe. Okay, but we also have the green markup image to show. So if I select probe two markup, we'll see control cells now shown in green. They're graduated depending on number of probes per cell, but we can see that as you would expect from the control, uh, positive control in this case, most of the cells are, are shown to be positive for at least one probe. Something which is a little bit more interesting is to look at the dual probe markup if I select this setting, we'll now have red cells present, showing the red uh, probes associated with that cell. We'll have green control, but we'll also have a, a third subset, which is shown in yellow. These are co-localized cells. So the cells have probes from both control and experimental. Cell detection I've previously optimized for this image. And the same could be said for probe one. If we go to probe two, there's an additional setting here which can be quite useful. And this is minimum probe two count. If I change this to one, what we'll see is that certain cells are dropped out of the analysis because these are cells that are not expressing any positive control. So you may wish to exclude those cells from the analysis. And this option here gives you the facility to do that. Okay, so style classification is again the same. You can edit these numbers according to your experimental conditions. And the advanced tab, as we saw before, allows you to focus in on a particular tissue subtype. Okay, so let's go ahead and analyze. Again, we'll do a field of view. We'll move over to the results section. And again, you've got the same, similar data output uh, this time, because we've got a second probe, we've got information on the uh, two probes shown here. We've also got this value for dual positivity. So 11% of cells were shown to contain both. Hi, Sean, if you're able to hear me, I don't think that we can hear you. Sorry, one second, folks. I think that we've had a technical problem with the audio.
So I think while we're waiting on Sean to rejoin, actually, I'll go ahead and uh, sh uh, share my screen, if that's possible. One second. <clears throat> so I think the last thing that Sean wanted to show um, was the uh, multiplex RNA uh, fish assay. Um, so we were just wrapping up the, uh, the Brightfield-ish um, assay using um, dual probes. Um, this is another option for those that are using uh, fluorescence probes. Uh, so I'm going to do the same thing um, as uh, we were showing with the ish algorithm, but this time I'm going to pick, uh, rather than ish, I'm going to pick the fish multiplex, uh, multiplex RNA uh, module. So I'm going to select that, and that's going to pull up um, the, uh, the settings for looking at um, up to four different probes in fluorescence. Now, um, in contrast to what we were doing in Brightfield, in fluorescence, we can pick our probes from a drop-down list. So we can see here, this is actually, uh, this particular image has three probes in addition to the, um, to the DAPI counter stain. And in fact, I can toggle these on and off. They're in different color channels. So we can toggle them and look at each of the probes individually um, if we want to. So rather than having to deconvolve the different colors, in this case, we can just pick from a drop-down list for the various probes. So what I'm going to do first is just pick my channel uh, two. So this is going to be the red probe. That will be my uh, probe one, uh, uh, my positive probe one in this case. Uh, for probe two, I'm going to pick um, the green probe. And then for probe three, we're going to pick the cyan probe here. Now, if I had a fourth probe, I could um, choose that here as well. And uh, I'll go down to cell detection, um, and here I'm going to turn on my cell detection to, to true, and we'll turn on this real-time tuning window. All right, so the cell uh, stain here is the, uh, is the uh, DAPI counter stain. And what we're looking at right now is the, um, the markup for uh, probe 1. So all of the cells which are positive for probe one are showing up with the red mark up here. Any of the cells which are negative for probe one are showing this uh, sort of black over, the, uh, um, over the, uh, the nuclear area. If I go to uh, probe two, I can look at the probe two markup as well. This is, again is going to show me the cells which are pro uh, positive for probe two and then those which are negative for probe two are showing up in black. And finally for probe three, if I look at the probe 3 markup, I can see the cells which are positive for probe 3. If I toggle this on and off, quite a few of the cells are positive for probe 3. I might want to increase my minimum um, uh, intensity level for this a little bit because I think some of the cells are probably uh, being picked up as false positives there. Okay, so that just gets rid of the, the background. So the last markup image here is to look at the quad probe markup. So this is going to allow us to look at all of the probes together. And in this case, um, if I just turn off the thumbnail, we can see uh, the cells which are positive, um, in this case for red, and uh, the cyan colored marker, in this case a cyan colored marker, in, um, as well as the green marker. And again, any of the cells which are negative for, um, uh, for all three of the markers in this case, or all four if you had four probes, are showing up with the black outline over the, uh, the nuclear area. Okay, so if I go to cell scoring, again, I can set up my scoring guidelines um, according to uh, the intensity um, of the probe. So this is actually an integrated intensity, so um, it's essentially the area of the probe times the intensity level of the probe. So in this case, I'm just going to set this up um, for 0 0.1 uh, will be our uh, limit for what is negative versus uh, 1 plus and then we'll set this up um, accordingly, one, two, and three. Now this can be set up according to your particular probe, um, but we'll just um, pick these numbers for this particular assay. Okay, so now um, let's just analyze this field of view. Actually, in this case, we'll just analyze the entire image. And we go over to the results here. We can see the total cell count, the percentage of the cells which are positive for our probe 1, 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus, probe 2, 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus, probe 3, et cetera, and also an overall H score for each of the different probes. Now, in this instance, I didn't actually collect cell-by-cell -cell information. 
if I go back to my advanced, um, I can do that as well. So we'll just analyze this uh, image again. And now, again, just like in the, with the bright field assays, I can get information about each of the cells. I can see exactly what the integrated intensity for that particular cell for probe one, so that's the red probe, and then also for probe two and probe three in that particular cell. And if I wanted to gate so that I only collect information on cells, for example, that are positive for probe one, I can use my filtering, as Sean showed before, to go to uh, custom, for example, and say does not equal zero. And now only the cells which are positive for my probe, um, for probe one, are going to be uh, shown in the, the cell list, um, or the cell data uh, in HALO and can be exported. Okay, so I think that's, um, that's it. I'll see if actually Sean is back on the line. Um, again, if not, I'm happy to answer the questions for him. If any of you have questions, feel free, uh, free to put them into the chat or the Q&A panel. I'll go ahead and go over there now. I think probably um, uh, there have been a few people who have already uh, asked questions to Courtney um, that have been answered, but Courtney, it might be good to just repeat those for the benefit of the rest of the audience, if you don't mind. Uh, sure, I can repeat some of these questions. Um, one question that was asked, um, is uh, you know, how is RNA scope developed uh, when using the chromogen uh, instead of fluorescence? And uh, basically with the chromogenic assay, the labeled probes uh, contain a chromogenic enzyme such as HRP or horseradish peroxidase that can be detected um, with either DAB or um, if it's uh, alkaline phosphatase, it's with fast red or green, it can be detected. Um, and then with the fluorescence assay, the labeled probes actually contain fluorophores um, so that can be directly visualized with a fluorescent microscope. And then, uh, let's see, we had um, there's another question further down. Actually, I had a question that came to me, so I'll hand sure. this one over back to you, um, Courtney, if you don't mind. Sure. So that, and notice that the automated duplex assay did not appear to be offered on the Roche Discovery Ultra XT platform. Is the duplex assay only available on the Leica Bond? Uh, yes, that is correct. It's, we have the duplex um, in brown and red for the uh, Leica Bond RX. Okay, excellent. And then someone so, had a, a very good question. Um, with genes expressed at high levels, uh, wouldn't dots start to overlap on top of each other? And can this more intense signal be accurately quantified using HALO? Um, and that is true. With a highly expressed uh, target, uh, it is possible for the dot dots to start to overlap, and that's where we start to see formation of clusters. And the clusters actually can be uh, quantified by the HALO software. Yeah, if, if you remember, actually, in the, um, when Sean was giving the demonstration, um, with, the single, uh, with the single probe, you could see that there are, were essentially orange probes and uh, red, uh, or red, sorry, orange dots and red dots. The orange dots were single, uh, essentially single probes, whereas the orange, um, or sorry, the, the orange uh, dots were single probes, and the red areas were essentially clumps or clusters of probes together. And we use um, uh, essentially declump those so that the the larger spots are um, uh, will be uh, segmented into multiple um, into multiple spots, so they're all counted accurately. Um, in fluorescence, we use a slightly different technique. We use um, what's called integrated intensity. So rather than counting the individual spots, we're looking at the area of the uh, probe uh, multiplied um, by the intensity of the probe. So um, it's a slightly different um, technique. We found we've, we've gotten more accurate results, particularly if we have a very, very high level of expression with the fluorescent probes. Okay, happy to answer any other questions that come through. I'm not sure I have anything that's come specifically to me, Courtney. I don't know if you've had anything that's come to you. Uh, no, uh, I, uh, I have no specific questions uh, directed to me. Okay, uh, sorry, a few things here. Um, let's see. Can you score spatial distribution of the signals? Yes, we can, actually. Um, using the, the plotting here, actually, the, um, we're able to spatially plot cells which are uh, positive for different probes. So, for example, if you wanted to look at the distribution, let's say, of PD-1 positive cells and PD-L1 positive cells, 
um, in the tissue or even cells that are positive for multiple markers in conjunction with each other, um, you can do that using a spatial plot. So we can look at the proximity of the various cells to, to each other in the tissue. Um, and that can be on a single um, tissue, like we're showing here, where we have multiple probes on a single, uh, single slide. Or it could be um, if you're doing, uh, particularly if you're in bright field, uh, serial sections where you've stained multiple images uh, with different probes and then registered those to together so that we can look at the spatial distribution of the probes um, uh, near to each other. There's a question here about the cell boundary and how it's determined by the HALO um, software. So in this case, this is a simple dilation away from the, centri from the nucleus. Um, by default, it's set to five microns, which we can see here. We can set this so if it's a confluent layer of cells, essentially it takes up all of the space around the, um, around the cells um, uh, in, or anywhere in between. So it really depends on the tissue, how the boundary is going to be defined or the, the size of the boundary. Um, let's see. There's another question here about whether HALO is able to compare serial sections to undergo analysis. Um, yeah, so I, I think I just addressed that a bit, which is, uh, yes, we can do serial section analysis to look at multiple sections and look at the distribution of, the, the, um, of different probes across multiple sections. Um, let's see here. All right. How does HALO calculate the, the size of the spot in the chromogenic assay? So actually the size of the spot is determined by the assay itself. We go back into, um, into the um, module here. Maybe we can load the settings. There we go. So we can see here uh, that the probe size is actually set within the algorithm. And this is also what's going to be used to essentially declump um, spots which are uh, clumped together in, the, um, in an image. Uh, so here we can define, for example, single spot is anything that's 2.1 microns or, low or less. And if we don't want to ca count the very, very small spots, considering some of those might be background um, in the image, we can also designate a specific minimum size for a spot. So this is actually used to declump or segment um, uh, spots uh, using the software in Brightfield specifically. Okay. So we're actually about eight minutes over, and I apologize. Some of that was the, the, the bit of a technical um, issue there um, at the end. But any of the questions that weren't actually answered today, um, we'll send along those to Courtney, or I'll send them to Sean, and we'll be sure and answer anything that, that wasn't answered today. So apologize if we didn't get to your specific question. Um, please also feel free to um, uh, email us at, um, at indicalabs at info at indicalab.com. Uh, Courtney, I don't know if you want to share the ACD bio. I, unfortunately, I don't have Sean's slide up, so I can't um, share your, uh, your contact details. But um, if you want to share those, uh, please feel free. Also, um, we will be sending out a recording of this webinar after today. Um, so at the end of the webinar, the contact details will be available as well. I'm sure any questions regarding RNA scope can be directed to our email address, support at acdbio.com. Terrific. Thank you so much, Courtney, and thank you, everybody, for, uh, for coming today. We look forward to seeing you at the next webinar.